So how would synthetic biology and new materials change the way that we manufacture key products such as pharmaceuticals, food, electronics, consumer goods, and more? That's the question. And in order to answer that question, we have, and I'm going to introduce the new panelists first. Meredith, um, maybe uh, you want to say a few words but because you haven't been on stage yet, but she's a partner with, a partner with partners. Um, and uh, you know, you are the first, uh, I guess, pure play investor here uh, on stage today. Maybe you want to say a couple of words and then I'll move on to the other new panelists and then we will take it from there. Sure, just do introduce you want, your, I was going to say by just, way of background. Yeah, just okay. introduce yourself sure. and, um, and then I'll, I'll give you a question. Uh, so um, I'm a microbiologist by training, so this is always an exciting uh, opportunity to talk about this, but actually an investor by practice partner at Partners Innovation Fund. We are the venture capital arm of Partners Healthcare. So even though I'm at MIT, which is actually also an alma mater for me, so I'm happy to be here, um, I actually represent investment interests in um, putting money to work in new companies on the basis of inventions coming out of the partner system. And in fact, um, the speaker that we just had before us uh, is actually operating on some te technology out of one of the PIs that we have. So terrific to see them doing so well and really exciting. Um, Partners focuses on putting money to work, as I said, in uh, new technologies, and so we look for opportunities where there are materials, medicines, as well as devices, and um, even diagnostics and software uh, that can be part of the life science ecosystem, both um, within the pharmaceutical industry and beyond. So uh, before I move to Malik, it just strikes me that uh, since some people have just come in, uh, this is Vincent Ling of Taikeda was just uh, speaking. Uh, we had Christine Santos from Manus Bio, one of the MIT startups that was on stage earlier. We have Professor Collins, of course, of the Collins Lab, uh, also <laughs> involved in a major amount of the startups presented here today. And then lastly, Malik Tucker from uh, Novartis. And uh, why don't you say a few words? So we have called you a uh, lab head of synthetic biology group, mm -hmm. but there's a lot to that. So <coughs> just give us a little sense of what you and Novartis are up to in this little field, and then we, we will get started. Sure. So I'm uh, Malik Thakur. I'm a molecular biologist by training. Uh, I'm a lab head in synthetic biology group um, at Novartis. So Novartis is, I believe, the, one of the first major pharma to start a dedicated synthetic biology group. Um, and, and this was started around four years ago. And we are still a, a small presence here, but we have uh, other colleagues in Basel, uh, which is our another site in Switzerland, uh, where are, are the, around 30 colleagues are involved in working on natural products, and, and we are trying to merge this syn synthetic biology and natural products uh, to expedite the, the research that we can do in natural products uh, discovery. Uh, this are, they are still uh, early days for us. Uh, we are looking for partners. We are really open to uh, there are search and evaluation teams uh, that are constantly looking and evaluating uh, various startups. And we have uh, some collaborations already going on with MIT. Uh, we had a project with uh, Tim Lu's lab earlier. Uh, we have a, a, an ongoing collaboration with uh, Chris White. Uh, it's, it's with Foundry, uh, which is MIT, uh, Harvard, um, UCSF, and Broad put together, uh, which, uh, which is headed by uh, Chris White. Uh, that's a multi-million dollar uh, collaboration that we have for five years. So, so things are looking really awesome right now. Perfect. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw the first question at, uh, at Professor Collins, because um, you obviously spoke earlier, and you were sort of talking about your work. But if you were to say, um, what should we, as an audience of a grand we, be the most excited about? And how should we structure this conversation about the application field that's opening up in synthetic biology? And remember, this discussion is being recorded so I can show it to my 10-year-old daughter. This is sort of gone are the slides and all of that stuff. We, we need to speak, hopefully, here at a level that everyone can, can understand. So you know, if you were explaining this you know, maybe to, uh, to a 10-year-old, what are the applications and, and, and what sh should they be focused on going well, forward? Yeah, so uh, I guess maybe I'll start with a, a cautionary comment. And that is that I think we have to bear in mind that it's very early in this field. And it's really hard to engineer biology. So we hear the success stories this morning. But most of the stuff that my lab tries to do doesn't work. And it takes us a long time to get what we want to work to work. 
And so when you face that coupled with the hype that surrounds this field, it's often difficult to discriminate between what's reality, what's the potential, and what's just uh, science fiction. And, and I think this field more than any has been troubled by that. Having said that, I think it's an incredibly exciting time. The field is not only young, it's small. So I think we also get media coverage that well outpaces the actual size. And at a point to this, iGEM, which is an undergrad uh, competition and program in, in synthetic biology, has more teams than there are active academic labs in the world. And so it speaks to that we're lagging behind. Having said that, if I were talking to a 10-year-old, and I talk to a lot of 10-year-olds, um, <laughs> is that I think that synthetic biology will be a defining technology of this century. It may not be the defining technology of this decade. I think machine learning will be that. But I think it will be a defining technology this century. And I think that we can turn to the power and diversity of biology to address, in part, many of the world's big problems. And that includes health, food and water, energy, and the environment. I think the challenges are huge. But I think bringing the engineering perspective to biology, which is really at the heart of what synthetic biology is about, is exciting. So on the applications, obviously, the, in the health is a space I focus on. I think it's very early in this space, but the ability to harness other organisms and biological components to both sense is there's something wrong in the patient's body and to also remediate, I think, is, is tremendously exciting. So this notion of having living medicines, living therapeutics and living diagnostics uh, is very early this decade, but I think will become a dominant theme the next decade and the decade after that. So I've had the blessing of having this feeling, and I don't know if this happens to you, but I get goosebumps when I really know that I'm in, a, in the right place at the right time, and I think I'm part of something exciting. We have had several of these moments, and I'm, I'm wondering if there's more of you that, you know, the statement you made is pretty striking. You think it's going to be the, basically the foundational technology of the next, next decade. Let's move to Christine and here. So you are, you know, obviously on the commercializing side of this. You, you've been in the lab, and now you're um, really on the on the lab floor and trying to commercialize this. What, what is the feeling inside of uh, a startup right now about the excitement, the potential? Does it feel like that when you are doing it? Does it feel like everyone is starting to realize what Professor Collins just said? Or does it feel earlier than that to you from a startup's perspective? I mean, I think definitely the sun. Should be. So, you know, and definitely for us, uh, we see a lot of potential for this technology. You know, we're really in the realm of chemical manufacturing. And um, the potential is enormous if you think about all of the different products that you use every day now that uh, contains ingredients that can be accessed through this technology. So, for example, you know, who here brushed their teeth this morning and used toothpaste with the you know, mint flavor? Or um, who here uses laundry detergents that have incorporated a lot of these fragrances that are sourced uh, from nature? Um, that's what this technology enables. It's essentially the, the middle class population has been growing. Uh, it's expected to more than double within the next decade. And there's been an enormous pressure on being able to find sourcing for the ingredients that are used in a lot of these products. And um, you know, our goal is really to be able to leverage these technologies, leverage fermentation-based processes to be able to access uh, these natural ingredients and make them uh, scalable, accessible, and affordable for not just a subset of the population, but really for uh, the entire world, um, especially as we see this uh, growth in the middle class. But Christine, uh, Manus Bio has been at this for a few years. Was, was the understanding, and we're going to move to partners in a while, but you know, was and is the understanding in the investment community um, at the level that, that Jim is presenting here, did, did, did a lot of people, when you came out with Manus Bio you know, a few years back, was this understanding that this is now ripe for massive sort of commercialization? Would you say that that has sort of evolved over the last few years? Or has, has you know, I guess the investment community from your perspective seen this already? And have they started adjusting for the fact that this perhaps is the new platform technology of the century? I mean, you know, absolutely. Uh, even before Manus Bio was founded, there are companies kind of exploring this space. Um, but I think we're now just starting to see the fruits of that labor, you know, with the um, commercialization, for example, of, um, you know, um, bio-based polymers from lactate acid fermentations and 1,3-PDO. And so, I, I mean, I think it, it's just the beginning. Um, certainly, it's a very challenging problem, but it's absolutely ripe for, for innovation. Mm -hmm. 
Vincent, uh, you have made some of your thoughts known to the public uh, here a few minutes ago on, on the market situation and how you have to exploit niches to, to be able to, to act in this space as a startup, but perhaps also actually as a large pharma. Because yes. the challenge, and that struck me you know, in, in what you said, I mean, the, the difference really isn't that great from my perspective if you sort of th think about all that we have heard today. It seems to me, and, and we'll have Novartis uh, you know, uh, address this later, but it seems to me that a company any size would be daunted by hearing that we're dealing with a technology that is the platform uh, technology of a century. Because who, who is a, a winner in that 10 years, 15, 20, 25 years from now? Can you address that yeah. challenge from the perspective of a large company yeah. that obviously wants to grow, but, but has to reckon with the fact that Synlogic here has grown up in two years and is listed on NASDAQ. And yeah. who knows how many other companies will be listed on NASDAQ before many large companies even say A, B, or C. That's right, that's right, yeah. So the, the speed of discovery certainly is faster in a startup, less bureaucracy. Uh, I enjoy the startup world, been in many startups myself, you know, I've made some myself. Uh, in a big company though, it has the reach to uh, develop drugs, and that's something that you can't do very well in a small startup. So, for example, right, um, when people start talking about new biological systems and we go to JP Morgan, you know, partnering conferences, a lot of biotechs come to us and start talking about their, uh, their platform technology. And um, on one hand, you can take the business approach and say, well, this has a lot of potential, okay, let's see what we can do with this and see where it takes us because it's a large addressable market. On the other hand, there's a certain pragmatic approach too. We know that it takes uh, upwards of 15 years from inception to getting a drug on the market, right? And that's daunting. Another thing that we have to keep in mind is that um, in pharmaceutical, uh, in big pharma, usually the chief executives change over once every five years, you know? And once that happens, you know, all projects are at risk because the new guy wants to put a stamp and make it as individualized, you know, um, portfolio of projects going through. And that dislodges a lot of things along the way. So these major shakeups happen once every five years. And so in the back of my mind, when I talk about this, I think, is this feasible in a time frame that we can execute on, all right? There's a time notion there, too. And timing is, makes all the difference in the world. Right now, really hot are you know, CAR T cells and things like that. And, uh, and you know, uh, microbiome is very, very hot. I agree, it's, it's a lot of promise. Um, but you know, how long will it take for this to get to market? And how, how large the clinical trial does it have to be? Does it use FDA approved products? Because if you introduce too many new things in the process, then you're inventing not just one drug, but an entire process that has to go through the FDA. But isn't that part of the point, and you know, this maybe brings us into a, a, a can of worms, but I mean, isn't that part of the point here that in, in this uh, synthetic biofield, not, not everything is gonna be uh, FDA approved, right? So some of the, I mean, there's nutraceutical spaces, yep. there's, you know, the, there's, there's a yes. lot of opportunity because yes. of the area yes. itself. I mean, this brings us, I, I think, to, to something I want to get to later, but I just want to, let, let me get to the end of the row. Meredith, can you address some of the, I don't know, the, the, the fears and also the, I don't know, the certainty in the investment community and, and in your community about what this is bringing to to, to us, and you know, what goes through your mind when you're going through these opportunities? What is it that entices you about it? Because clearly, um, it's not all certain. Sure. Um, and some experiments do fail. A lot of it, yes, most. I think Jim hit the nail on the head, right? <laughs> um, the way I think about it is actually maybe a little bit different. Um, I think we can look at the past, maybe in the past 10 years, because for instance, you know, about 10 years ago when sort of there was an era of uh, biofuels, and biofuels and biomaterial companies that were um, somewhat all the rage from the investment community. And what they ran into was part of what Jim said, which is biology is hard. And then um, I think part of what Vincent said, which is uh, the time horizon for products is long. Um, and then I would, fa I would fold in a couple other things on that, which is price, volume, and industry, because those three things actually all have to align in order to be successful within a marketplace. And so I think what Christina was alluding to, which is sort of a flavor and fragrance um, uh, arena, is one where you have a higher price per volume, you have a different speed of being able to get into the marketplace. You have a longer time horizon for interest in a product, unlike a nutraceutical, where those are very trend-driven. 
um, and you have a different type of regulatory body than you do in the FDA, right? And so I think those are the types of things in the way that we actually need to think about it because, you know, if we're back to what Novartis is doing, which is looking at uh, developing perhaps new forms of natural compounds, things like that, that's terrific. But, um, you know, I'll throw it to you two. How much is a single new molecule in your screening library worth to you at this moment? And does it make sense for me as an early stage startup to make a whole bunch of those molecules because I need to understand how much you guys are going to pay me for those, how long it's going to take for those potentially to get to market, um, how, uh, how challenging it might be within sort of a new, uh, let's call it, uh, regulatory regime that has to react to things like that, um, that actually really are important factors in making decisions about how to actually put money to work and when to put money to work into startups. I don't know if you very quickly want to address that. Yeah, so, so let me like step back and uh, try to summarize what we've uh, been talking uh, in the panel and even all the presentations. Uh, and so, so if you try to look at a picture as a, as a bullseye, then at the most periphery are the uh, flavors, fragrances, and food uh, industry. And then, then if you get one level inside, then you get nutraceuticals and probiotics. Um, and then if you come even uh, nearer to the bullseye, then, then you have, say, the diagnostics. And at the core is the pharmaceuticals. And, and I think this, this is what we are trying to summarize, right? Uh, so, and it is all from uh, creating the niche to the most needy requirements. The core is the, when we say pharma, then, then it's the need. We, we need these medicines. Uh, the periphery is not something we need. We are creating niche. The fragrance or, or flavor, there are other alternatives, for, for, whereas for, for the core, there are no other alternatives. Um, the other things that we uh, probably touched upon was um, going outside to inside. What we see is um, the, the stakes are higher, the risk is high, uh, and it takes a longer time to develop a molecule. Uh, in that bullseye going out uh, from out to inside. And uh, uh, yeah, the approval is also it starts getting stricter and stricter. So if you are a startup, just getting back to your question, if you are a startup, then probably this is the high risk area if you are at the center or, or the core of the building. But if you start from the periphery and then start getting in, then probably that's the best way to get in. That, that's how I'll... Uh, so we're going to soon bring in the audience, because I promised. Uh, but I have one little quick thing that I want you to all handle. So we were talking here about as if there is sort of a center and periphery discussion. But if you think about some of the maybe hidden things, and maybe some, somewhat away from the drug use case, but what are some of the ways the synthetic biology is already affecting our lives? And if each of you just can come up with an example or something that I may not think about, or the audience is maybe not thinking about, that's already becoming either an experimental part of something that I should care about or, or actually is already embedded. Okay. And maybe, maybe we start this way. Uh, Meredith, do you have an example? Uh, I would note the, uh, the non-GMO movement that I think is quite interesting in the food and probably in flavor and fragrance because uh, one of the things that's sort of up for um, debate at this moment is whether something that is actually uh, manufactured by an engineered organism separated from that organism and then delivered into a product qualifies as being GMO, genetically modified organism. Um, and I think that that's an interesting one. If any of you are at Whole Foods, you'll see that stamp everywhere. Um, and something that will be quite interesting for us because I think synthetic biology is going to be pushing more and more and more um, uh, foods, uh, food products into the marketplace and sort of how that is actually handled with uh, the pushback perhaps on things can being considered non-natural is an interesting one. That's a, that's a great point and it brings us to something. We'll, we'll see what, what the audience question takes us into, but it certainly brings up the dimension of Europe and other places where yes, that is a absolutely. massive, it massive, massive even discussion. More, even so more we haven't challenging. even yeah. broached that topic yet, but let's, that, great. Um, Vincent, a, a quick point? Yeah, sure. Um, my PhD is actually in plant biology. It's not in, uh, uh, it's not in pharmaceutical science, right? And so from a plant biology background, um, it's interesting that, like you said, you know, how does uh, uh, engineered things affect your daily lives? I'd like to point out that most, if not all, the foods, the natural foods that we eat are engineered already by plant breeding, okay? Wheat is probably one of the most engineered crop plants you can think of. It's alohexaploid, it comes from six different parents. 
8,000 years of history there. You know, the genetics behind that is, is phenomenal, right? And you just don't do it by using genetic engineering. You just do it by breeding. But it's synthetic. The, you know, the regular wheat that we eat is not real. Okay. And so a lot of people don't understand this. So this educational process too. Yeah. Like, is GMO really bad? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Christine? I mean, I think what's interesting is that, um, you know, although synthetic biology is seen as a relative new, f new field and there's resistance in some areas to, you know, concepts like GMO, like these processes have been around for decades. Um, the fermentation production of enzymes and products are, they're already embedded in things that you use in your daily lives. Um, biotech enzymes such as proteases and lipases are incorporated into your laundry detergents. Um, you have, again, as I mentioned before, bio-based polymers from lactate acid fermentations and 1,3-propendiol that are in your um, apparel, carpets, diapers, uh, food packaging, plastic utensils. I mean, it's basically ubiquitous already, and so I, I do believe that there needs to be kind of an education process to get consumers to understand that this is something that has been around for a long time and has made uh, enormous contributions to um, daily life. Perfect. We may pick up on all these, but I, my promise is looking very thin here. So let, let's quickly get, uh, get on to... Uh, yeah, so I'll go quickly. I, I don't think the field is embedded yet. I think it's too young. But I think we are beginning to see tools and intermediate capabilities being introduced, both in research as well as impacting industries where you may never see a product. So Ginkgo Brazil has multiple partnerships where there are engineering organizations for companies that are using those to make things. You'll never see yeah. the Ginkgo product, but it's very... But there are some examples, so I'm involved in one, Sample 6, that actually has a food diagnostic that's approved and in 70 different facilities around the world doing rapid path food pathogen detection and already impacting a, a number of industries to keep you healthy. Perfect. Yeah, I'll give you a, a very specific example of a recent drug launched by Novartis called CTL-019, marketed by a different name, Chimera. Uh, so that's... Uh, a first CAR T uh, cell therapy, uh, which has been approved by FDA. And uh, what they do there is, this is for pediatric ALL, uh, uh, basically uh, leukemia, cancer, uh, blood cancer in, in kids. Um, and uh, what they do is they uh, take uh, the patient's T cell and they bring it to the lab. They use uh, viruses to re-engineer them and put it back into the patients so that now uh, these T cells can recognize the cancer cells and they eat them away. So, so this is uh, kind of synthetic biology right there being I used. I love the beauty of the example and, too because yeah. actually so, I think a 10-year-old can grasp that concept. This yeah. is wonderful. Let's see what the audience has to say. Uh, please shoot. Uh, any question is good and any question is legit. Any, anyone uh, have something to kick it off? All right. Yes, and lift that up. It's that yeah. side okay, of the mic. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, up, 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 even yeah. more. It's a it's microphone. Good. It okay. just looks like a box. Okay. <laughs> For the ten-year-olds, it's a great toy. Um, so, a great discussion so far. Excellent. Maybe a point that you know people may be thinking about, and we a little bit with the GMO relationship uh, thought about it as well. The ethics, you know, um, reaction to this area. But then, you know, it, some of the comments made me think, what is really natural and what is really synthetic? If bacteria in the nature changing something, it's okay. But if a human being is thinking about it and changing it with some tools, is it not okay? So I'm curious how people are really thinking about it. Thanks, Erdogan. This was Erdogan from, from GE Ventures. Um, Anyone want to pick that up? What is natural and what is not? I think, Meredith, what you were uh, touching on it. Uh, but uh, does anyone want to pick that up? It's an important discussion, I think, that uh, we can't hide from. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question comes down to who actually gets to define that and who should be defining that. Because I think, again, within each industry, there are probably going to be needs for a regulatory body to set that standard, as well as also sort of an industry body. And then I think, importantly, a consumer body as well. And some of that probably comes back to um, you know what we were talking about earlier, which is the level of education and understanding that each of those groups of, uh, let's call them stakeholders, need in order to make that definition um, you know, qualified for the way that I think we're evolving in our understanding here. And it'll be interesting to see how that continues to play out moving forward. Jim? And make one comment that I think it's an important distinction, but probably not the right one. And that is, I think the right one is safe. Are you introducing something that's safe? And, and while I say that is that you know, I work in antibiotics, 
and I've had the FBI in my office multiple times concerned about synthetic biology. And are, we, are we and others going to make something that's dangerous? And I keep telling them, it's not us you need to worry about. It's nature. And that nature makes nasty stuff. And we are going to lose hundreds of thousands of people from natural stuff. And so it's really safe versus unsafe. And in our SynLogic example, where they're moving their trials underway, FDA has embraced what they've done, in part because they're actually introducing natural components in a synthetic way into the environment, uh, endowing it with new capabilities. So it really gets after safety, obviously, also efficacy. Next question. Yep. All right, let's see. You can do it. <laughs> you ready? Good keep, luck. Wow. keep watching. They might need you in New Orleans on Sunday. <laughs> that was good. Uh, so, so at, at Ginkgo, this is a really important topic uh, about how the industry can accept GMO uh, or GMO-derived ingredients. Our, our, our CEO has actually written a New York Times op-ed on this, and we're very pro-transparency. Um, I think in the past, sometimes uh, industry would sweep certain things under their rug because for whatever worry. Uh, so we're very pro-transparency in, 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 in whether something is made with the uh, GMO or not. And, and the other thing is, is when you're moving, therapies are a little bit different. Uh, therapies, GM, you're going to take, you're, you're sick, you're, you're going to do it. But when you're looking more at consumer products, uh, it's really, it doesn't matter. We can in this room talk about how it's safe and it makes sense and everyone probably agrees, uh, but it's really the consumer public that uh, we have to uh, convince. And, and so there, oftentimes it's an almost an emotional response. And so that's something that we think about, uh, you know, we have a team basically dedicated to that because I, I do think it's very important to, in the industry as it expands to different, uh, in synthetic biology as it expands to different industries. Ooh. Who wants to pick that up? It was a little bit more of a comment, but is there is there someone who? Yeah, I would like to add something to it. Um, so, so when when we say GMO, it's a very negative term, and uh, but there's a positive side to uh, this conversation as well, and which is about um, <coughs> chemical versus natural. And uh, there's an example. I'm not sure whether it's Kinko or somebody else. They are into vanillin. Vanillin. They are trying to engineer yeast or bacteria to produce vanillin. Now, if you look at that chemical, it's like a phenolic aldehyde. It's the simplest chemical to synthesize. And that's the reason we see it being added commercially available. You have vanilla flavor for everything because it's a very cheap molecule to make. Then why are we going uh, this way, uh, uh, using biology to synthesize them? It's because anything that has that chemically derived vanillin goes to Walmart, whereas if you uh, make it through biology, you can label it as all natural and it can go to Whole Foods. Yes, right? that's right. So, yeah. so that's, that's a big positive on that end. Just to punctuate two comments that have been made that I think are very important. And I go back to... <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the impact of synthetic biology and therapeutics, I think is going to be at two levels. One, natural products and diversity have been hampered by deconvolution and synthesis. And then now we have biosynthesis and predictability. And that has hampered a lot the use of natural products. Uh, that is, was mentioned by the lady and by others, and I think it's, it's going to be fundamental. And second, cell therapies have been with us, but they haven't been with us really for the last, what, 15 years? They didn't take off. And they didn't take off because of potency and because of measuring pharmacology. And these are the two things, and manufacturing. And these are the three things that potency, pharmacology, and manufacturing that synthetic biology can bring to that carefully, of course. But these are two things that I, I, I'm not sure were said, but as, as the young synthetic biologists that we want to be, these are three things, or so four things for th therapeutics that are, are going to be critically enabled. I believe. Thank you. Yeah, so maybe I should add, in a pharmaceutical company, um, people look at the impact of what your therapy brings, okay? So even if it's very exotic, if the payoff is huge, right, they'll invest in it, right? So for example, CAR-T, I think is fairly, uh, I mean, academically, it's interesting and it works, but I think uh, scaling it up so it's affordable to everyone is going to be a, you know, uh, it's going to be a, a huge task, right? Um, but the payoff is huge as well, too. And so people will go into that, as you can see. Uh, 
I really enjoyed it. I wanted to ask a question, though. It seems like the sky's the limit in terms of the natural drugs that uh, we can produce nowadays. But uh, if we think about oral administration, yes, we'll get to the colon, could be colonized or not, maybe needed or not. Some metabolites will get to the liver, the kidney. Are there other diseases where you think the delivery will be a limiting aspect in which you want to get your drug, your natural drug, to a specific area? Will then the delivery be important because you can use then potentially materials as a depot, as a, a, a way to use adhesive, for example, for localized delivery as a, as a depot for release of stuff over time? Uh, so you may not need to take them on a daily basis. So some of this aspect of, okay, we can overcome manufacturing, we have a range of drugs we can now, we can now produce, how do we deliver them and get them to the right place in the right time? All right, so is, uh, anyone? Yeah. Um, so Vincent, uh, who else wants to address this? Yep. Uh, okay, so what you're getting at, when I was uh, uh, showing you Lupron Depot, right, um, it came out first as a one-year deep, uh, one-month depot, three-month, now there's six months, right? The six-month depot took 10 years to develop, okay? The other ones, of course, led up to that, right? But as you see, the payoff was huge. So having depot drugs is, uh, is, is, is a, a very large addressable market. Uh, I'd say uh, blood-brain barrier is one that's interesting. Um, there's a lot of interesting new work that's coming out, um, even by, of course, some researchers within our system, uh, looking at natural metabolites that are um, created in the gut by our microbiome that actually are um, uh, a conduit across the, uh, let's call it the gut-brain axis, that actually are crossing the blood-brain barrier and appear to have um, implications for neural health in many different types of either disease states or actually aging states. That's quite an interesting one. And then I would actually say uh, the other area that I think is also quite interesting and uh, or sort of other areas that are underexplored would probably be um, uh, the mouth, the ear, and actually uh, women's health as well, which are areas that I think, you know, there's been a lot of attention to date play, uh, paid so far to the gut because we're really starting to understand that. There's been a lot of focus there, but there's other areas sort of of the human uh, body that I think will become quite important and that we're building better and better understandings of, and I think delivery to those systems will be quite uh, a key piece as well. Two additional areas, I think any area not well vascularized is always a challenge, yeah. and then the second is any sort of implant-based infection is a challenge. And then a larger comment is that I think synthetic biology actually holds potential to enhance delivery mm -hmm. and requires enhanced delivery to get circuits. So one historical comment is when we first got excited about this space back in 2000 and introduced something like the toggle switch. I remember giving talks back then when gene therapy was popular that we would come in as the control guys once the field worked out the delivery challenges. That field imploded on itself, came back about five years ago, kind of unannounced, with still the same delivery challenges. And that both safety and efficacy, can you get enough? Now when they turn to us, they're looking for control, but in many cases, they don't have the right viral vectors that enable us to put the size of circuitry that we'd like. And so I think there are fascinating new challenges, including in the commercial space, at the interface of the two. We'll take one more question, and then uh, I'm going to just prep the panel. We're, we're moving to the future that Jim was talking about. So I'm going to ask, be asking you about some applications in the, in the long-term future. So think about that while we're listening to this question. Um, where are the uh, discovery bottlenecks? Where are you finding challenges, finding new, new, new products to take into the clinic and, and, and you know, new, or new products, new commercialization products. Oh. <laughs> Crash of microphones. Um, who, yeah, Christine, perfect. So I, I think for my area in kind of chemical manufacturing, um, it's well understood that nature holds enormous uh, wealth of diversity in compounds that have a lot of interesting bioactive properties. Um, but the main issue is in trying to identify what those compounds are, right? Uh, and so um, I think uh, in terms of the discovery bottlenecks, it's really um, how do you uh, create those large natural product libraries that then become available for screening for a number of different applications, whether it be uh, for pharma or for um, consumer products or, or whatnot. And so um, I think, you know, basically how do you access that diversity and how do you find the right applications? Uh, yeah, if there's directly to that, uh, go ahead. Um, I, I would say I think, you know, we've made a lot of progress on coli as a chassis, um, but if we want to look to other organisms, particularly that are related to human health, um, you know, there are a lot of other uh, uh, good 
uh, microbes out there, um, but we really don't have the genetic tools uh, to effectively uh, manipulate those. And so building additional uh, parts libraries, uh, additional understanding on in just uh, the sort of the depth of the genomes that we have coverage on, as well as also um, the, the vector piece that Jim brought up, which is how, what's the um, amount of new DNA um, that we can actually deliver into organisms is, you know, in my view, uh, some of the pieces if we want this to expand even further sort of beyond the kind of the coli yeast paradigm that seems to be kind of the dominant um, piece right now. So quickly, the three development bottlenecks I'll put is one is that we still don't have a great ability to put together parts in a defined way that gets you the function in a quantitative manner that you want out. Second is we don't have as many parts as people think and as we'd like. And so we have to harvest. And then three, which has now become a, a dominant theme in the field, is that we thought by taking so-called orthogonal parts, so parts that normally wouldn't exist in the bug and putting a circuit, would allow you not to have interactions in a meaningful way and screw up your circuit. And that's just not the case in the sense that uh, you actually introduce a circuit, you put a significant metabolic energe energetic demand on the bug, and it's the biggest challenge we have right now is how do you get the bug to stay happy and to have that circuit or pathway do what you want it to do while the bug remains happy. So um, <clears throat> please play with me now, panel, because this is uh, typically a little challenging. So if we're looking at the meaningful future, and I don't know what that is, so I'm going to ask this to you in stages, and I want kind of like rapid fire responses. And it's fine if you don't have one, you can just move on, and I'm not trying to push your buttons, but I'm trying to just push a point here. In the next two years, Name one meaningful innovation, concern, worry, anything that we should be concerned about or excited about, Malik. Uh, exciting is uh, the microbiome field. I feel uh, there is, there's a lot going on in that space. Uh, and since it's a new area, a lot of groundwork needed to be done. But I believe now is the time when we'll start seeing the fruits coming Perfect. out soon. Yeah. Using engineered exosomes to deliver synthetic circuits to uh, uh, human cells. I mean, I think the focus still needs to be on consumer uh, perception and adoption of these new products that are coming out. Uh, in the next couple of years, I think uh, implanted cell bioreactors. Uh, I'd say clinical readouts of cell-based therapy, be they actually engineered T cells or um, engineered coli. Let's move to five years, Malik. Oh. <laughs> Let's call it five to seven. I mean, you know, we'll call it five to seven. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the, the next uh, stage. Yeah. I, think, I think the diagnostics is one another field which uh, probably will benefit a lot from synthetic biology developments, and that thereby uh, pharma will also be benefited from that. Jim? Engineered exosomes that can be injected <laughs> into your blood <laughs> as synthetic sentinels that can sense what's going on. The academic voice has an answer I'll, I'll to this. So this theme, is not right? an NSF. So yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. I get it. I get it. So we'll move to. I might not, you may not hear exosomes again from yeah. you. <laughs> We're going to move outside yeah. your comfort zone soon. Uh, Christine. Uh, uh, I don't have yeah, complex chemistries access. That's an issue. Uh, I would say magnetically charged particles that could go anywhere in your body based on magnetism. Magnet magnetic force, nanoparticles now. Okay. Uh, can CRISPR-Cas really translate um, continue, uh, successfully into the clinical paradigm? Okay. All right, so let's make it easy. Uh, let's move to 15, 20 years. <laughs> no. no idea. <laughs> no idea? Jim. Evolvable antibacterials. Ones that can, evolvable that? antibacterials, ones that evolve in the face of emerging resistance and remain effective in the face of resistance. Okay. I think for me it's the existence of multiple microbial chassis that can produce building blocks used for commodity chemicals, very basically high volume, low value uh, chemicals. Engineered humans. <laughs> uh, um, can we figure out what to do with phage? With? Phage. Okay. So let's move to Jim's original time frame, the next 100 years. Malik? None of us will be here, so why can't <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Our kids maybe will be here. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, maybe that's, depending that's something on your, we can do. <laughs> depending Immortal on some, human beings. You know? right. OK. Yeah. Immortality. <laughs> Jim? Biology will still not be an engineering discipline. Yeah. Yeah. But we, uh, <laughs> we will have significantly enhanced our capability to design. OK. So I agree with that, kind of better understanding of the intricacies and complexity of biology and being able to more easily engineer that. Um, I think a, a really interesting new application that 
probably will take pretty long to establish is um, you know, the DNA-based data archiving. I think that's a really hot new topic and curious to see where that goes. Vincent? Hmm. Yeah. yeah I, I think, you know, uh, universal genetic profiling, you know, where uh, the entire population is uh, analyzed for <coughs> genomes. Uh, and I would say I'd hope that we'd be able to uh, make some real progress on solving what I expect to be food, climate, and water crises in the next hundred years, because I think that this discipline actually has opportunity to do that, unlike other areas. Okay. Is there any burning questions? There is a burning question. Can you turn up the mic? About a uh, thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering about other disciplines like artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, digital health. How do you see certain other disciplines coming into synthetic biology and how do you see those two uh, collaborate and strengthening each other? Who wants to take that up? Jim? So we, we've engaged in a number of discussions this the last six months and where I think it can help is can one use machine learning and even deep learning, so deep learning, I think we can actually generate the data sets that could be meaningful, to enable us to infer design rules. And so can you go from sequence to function? So you can envision doing that quite simply with the RBS calculator that Chris Voigt's group did. So where on base sequence, you can actually get to function. Can you go further? You can do it with the ribo switches. Can you now get to protein from sequence on the same function? Can you go to circuitry? Can you go to pathways, synthetic circuits? I think there's great potential there to really now expand our ability to design directly from all the AGTC sorts that we heard from Asimov to getting to functional components. And Google's very interested in this space. And I would agree there, but I think it's also a question of can we get to the scale of data that will allow us to actually build the algorithms that are going to give us the right output, right? I think it's Google can test it and if it can be done. Yeah. <laughs> well, we so unfortunately, need, Google can't right. generate the but data. But it can generate the data, and right. So they are reaching exactly. out. But George Church can generate the data. Right. 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 As, as, so right. we have George. Right. To right. Or, or so, some of the companies, right? So yeah. I think, you know, uh, Ginkgo advertised last year uh, that they made a huge buy from Twist, which was, I can't remember the number of zeros on the yeah. base pairs, yeah. maybe. But, uh, you know, they're going to build and test. There you go. You're going to build and test all those parts. You're going to track those. If you've got a database and a software that can scale with that, maybe you can go in and actually build some of the learnings out of that. You know, that'll be proprietary to them. So we have a question of whether we have public access to it, right? But you know, I think uh, someone will that, do it. I, I think actually synthesis probably is not going to be the answer because it's too expensive. No. Yeah. But I think generating diversity yeah. through large-scale mutagenesis and then be able to select for a function oh, and couple that sequence yeah, yeah. is we going to be economically, first, so yeah. you take advantage of biology, which we have not done as a field, which is it biology does. evolves and biology likes to reproduce. We take advantage of the reproduction, but not the evolved aspects is where I think we can get after the data size yeah. that deep learning will need. I think the other really important way in which computational can uh, assist us here is not just on the design component of biology, but basically understanding how biology works. So it's really leveraging these large data sets that are generated through proteomics and metabolomics in order to really understand what the underlying biochemistry is. Because uh, having that uh, understanding of the genotype-phenotype relationship is what will allow us to advance further. Malik, any, any thoughts on uh, machine learning? I, I feel uh, going on those uh, lines that we were mentioning, with all this genome sequencing, uh, human genome sequencing companies that are there, if the new generation of kids, like whoever is born, gets a genome map, then, then that will initiate a lot of machine learning. We'll have everyone getting sequenced, and based on that, we'll be able to predict a lot of diseases and, what, and patterns. So, so that, that's where I see. Uh, so, so lastly, and, and we really have 40 seconds left, but if you have a challenge to some existing MIT engineers, or really anybody who is uh, developing companies out there, what, what should they be focusing on right now? building the best team you can. And, and it's all about team. It's, unfortunately, it's not about my technologies, it's about the team. So all the successful companies that, that I'm involved with, it's the business folks, the science folks that team up. It's not, it's not technology. So come to networking it events helps, like this. Right? It, does yeah. help. it's a, it helps, but it's, it's really, it's, it's five, 10 percent of the story. It's building, getting your team together. And I think on that note, I want to just hope that we can uh, thank the panel for this ex uh, extraordinary contribution. Thank you very much.
And as we're wrapping up, please just sit for one minute if, and be patient uh, with me. Uh, I just wanted to announce two different things. So first of all, thank you to all the rest of the speakers. This has been an extraordinary turnout, I think, and we were very pleased to see what's going on in the field of synthetic biology and new materials here at MIT and, and obviously beyond with our partners and you know, corporate uh, activity. Um, there's two events, talking about events, that you should know about if you don't already. Next week we have a health uh, um, and sensing conference that brings together lots of interesting technologies in health. Um, and that's going to be on campus, so exciting uh, to think about attending that one. And as I previously announced, we have a Cracking Cancer 2.0 event in December, similar format to this. And as you note, it's the second one in its, uh, you know, in its turn. And I think the idea here is, you know, some people told me, well, why do you do a, another event on cancer? Well, I think the situation is a little similar as with synthetic biology. You know, what was news last year is not news this year. I mean, this, there are just so many, uh, even of some of the same startups that are telling very, very different stories this year because the field is just moving so rapidly. So that will be another interesting place, I think, to discuss synthetic and non-synthetic biology and, and other topics, uh, you know, that are happening in and around MIT as regards cancer, technology, innovation, startups, all of that. Uh, and with that, I wanted to thank everybody for coming and uh, also invite you to, uh, you know, stay here for a little bit and, and uh, network and uh, partner with us. And if uh, you are left here without knowing how to get hold of us. Uh, we haven't done our mission right, so I want to again repeat that on the corporate side, there is Cheryl, there is John, and there should be Eric, but maybe he's out there talking. Um, and you can also grab any of us, Marcus or, or myself, Tron, uh, if you're interested in the startup perspective on things. And with that, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. And uh, it seems like synthetic biology will not remain a secret for very long. Thanks. <laughs>